All right, we're walking through the steps of Old Testament exegesis. And as we're talking about this fourth step, what we talked about is determine the literary genre, step one. Read through the entire work of all possible, step two. Consult several translations, that was step four. Determine if the author gives us any insights into the purpose of his book, that's step four. And then now we're looking at the idea of key words. Let me say this, though. Getting back to talking about genre, but now as we're moving through these steps, the Old Testament is a different animal than the New Testament. And it's as if God intended for us to think more globally with the Old Testament and then think more particularly with the New Testament. The New Testament lends itself to really diving into particulars, to looking at syntax, grammatical structure, and things along that line. Greek is a much more precise language than Hebrew. And so the languages that God has chosen in order to give us his word kind of lend themselves to different exegetical work. So when we're studying the Old Testament, we're not going to approach it like we're going to approach the New Testament because the genre, the type of writing that the Old Testament is, is just different. It's just different. And so we have to recognize that truth about the Old Testament and recognize that we're approaching the Old Testament from an angle that we're not going to approach the New Testament with. We're just going to study the Old Testament a little bit differently. All right, so in talking about key words, key words, we ask the question, how do you find key words? First is by repetition. When we have the class next quarter on logos, Mike will show you how to do searches. And in those searches, you'll say, show me every noun and verb that is found in 1 Kings. And those particular reports, by virtue of what you're asking, are going to take a little bit more time. I mean, you may have to wait as many as like 16, 17 seconds. Yeah, so we'll get a cup of coffee because it's going to take, you know. But then it will produce this master list of all of the key words or the repeated words and where they're found. Now, you can ask it to show you the words in Hebrew. You can ask it to show you the words in Greek, I mean in English. But the words, the English, are based upon the Hebrew. So you actually are looking at the Hebrew word. And here is an advantage to this. The basis of the search is the Hebrew text. But you don't need to know the Hebrew text. You're just saying, I want you, Logos, to use the Hebrew text and generate this list of these words that occur. And then it's going to generate a report that's in English. And so if you've got a particular word, like say the word offering, and the word offering is translated in English maybe two or three different ways. Well, it's going to give you every time the word offering occurs, not just the times that it's translated offering, but maybe the time that it's translated sacrifice. Are you following? 
All right, so it's, a, it's an amazing, wonderful study tool that generates these reports uh, just like that. And so then what you do is you create a folder that's just called favorites of which you save these reports in your favorite repo, uh, folder by books. And so like on my computer, if I want to look at the, 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 all, the master list for keywords in Genesis, then I go to my favorites, I open the folder on Genesis, and, and it, it regenerates that report, and it regenerates it faster because it's already done it for you one time. Then, as, like say in the, in the book of Genesis, the word uh, Elohim is a key word in Genesis. Well, are there some variations to the way the word Elohim is used uh, in the book of Genesis? Like sometimes it's El, sometimes uh, it's Elah. Okay, well, I don't know what that means. You're saying it doesn't matter. Uh, now we're asking it. We want all of the variant forms of this particular word to be produced in this master list. All right, so 2.3 seconds, it'll generate that list for you. Well, now I've got a particular search saved on <coughs> Elohim in Genesis, and I drag that, and I drop it into my Genesis folder. So now I've got two things in my Genesis folder. I've got a master list of all keywords. Then I have a particular uh, generated list just on the word Elohim. That's going to be the list that I'm then going to take and I'm going to get out my crayons and I'm going to start coloring all of the occurrences of the word El, uh, Elohim in the book of Genesis. Now you can save those and uh, you can um, put them in a separate uh, file in your, your, in your computer. Uh, for example, I use uh, Evernote, if you know what that is. Uh, I've got uh, master key lists in Evernote. As a matter of fact, uh, this summer, um, I was away and somebody was asking if, if I had a, a, a master key list uh, breakdown for one of the New Testament books. Well, I didn't, but I knew that Mike did. And so I sent Mike a text and I said, can you send me a copy of the, um, all of the key words for the book of, I forget now which book it was, it's like Colossians or something like that. Well, he's at Disneyland with his wife and kids. And he's getting this text from me saying, you know, can you send me uh, all the Colossian? So, you know, he's standing in line, which is what you pay good money for. <laughs> Um, so he gets into his Evernote account. He's got the master, uh, not the master list, but he's got all of the keywords broken down. And so within 10 minutes, he had sent me that list uh, from the Evernote account. Anyway, there are stuff that you can do where you have uh, these resources that are, are constantly and continually available to you. Now, right now, you may not be getting what... I'm talking about with the color coding and all that. We're going to talk a lot more about that later. But uh, basically the point is this. To turn our Bibles into exegetical study tools. And, you know, I go through this and people say, oh, yeah, you can buy Bibles that do that at, at Mardell's. No, you can't. <laughs> what they sell you are Bibles that are color coded according to themes. They're not exegetical study Bibles. You're going to have to produce those on your own. And um, it, it allows your childhood to come back out. And uh, you get out the crayons, and you're just having so much fun uh, turning your Bible into a rainbow of color. But what happens is you go through the, the book of Genesis, and you say, all right, so the word God is a key word. The word land is a key word. The word promise is a key word. And each one of those, you're going through and you're coloring them a different color. And by the time you get done with the, the master 
your list of key words for Genesis, you've got an amazing visual image of what's going on in the book of Genesis. Just, uh, and I know you'll get into this later, but typically, how many different colors do you use in your exegetical work? Uh, it depends on the size of the book. Um, if we're looking at a smaller <coughs> book, like uh, maybe, well, Obadiah is an extreme example, one chapter, but I'll, <coughs> I'll use uh, probably four or five colors in Obadiah. Uh, then when you've got a really large <coughs> book, uh, like an Isaiah, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 25 to 30 keywords. And I... You, this is somewhat subjective, right? But there's going to be a, a break point where you say, I, "I'm only going to talk. I'm only going to color code words that occur 50 times or more." And so you've got these words that occur 40 times. We're not saying they're not important, and in, in the exegetical process, they won't be ignored. Those words are going to get their due consideration. But as far as what we're trying to do in color coding, there, there has to be a break-off point. Right. Somewhere. So does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Yeah. Do you keep your, your colors consistent with whatever you're marking throughout the, the whole book? Like if you go to... I, I don't. And that's, that's something that uh, those of you that are just starting, uh, I would recommend that you do. But I, I would not recommend that you're using the same color for the same word. Instead, use the same color for the most uh, uh, repetitive word in that book. For example, let's say you're going to make yellow your number one frequently occurring word. In every book, if it's yellow, that's telling you that is the word that occurs most frequently in that book. And then say blue is the second most frequently occurring word. Are you following? Yeah. Uh, so that would be the, the way I would recommend that you do that. Now in the New Testament, I'm trying to consistently do Paul's words in the same color. So if, if I've made grace blue, then I've tried to make it uh, grace blue in all of the books. And I, even, I haven't even succeeded at, uh, at doing that really good. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I know you know you probably finished your whole book, but uh, do you make notes to the color at the beginning of the book, or how do you, how do you make notes on them? Or oh, I guess what's your yeah. key? <coughs> legends or something? Yeah, your legends key. Yes, uh, I do that at, at the beginning. Uh, you'll have, and I know you can't can't see this, but. I just happen to have my Bible open to Ecclesiastes. Well, in my margin over here, uh, I've got all the key words written down uh, for Ecclesiastes. And um, then the number of times that particular word occurs in Ecclesiastes. And then what I do is, uh, for example, the word vanity is a key word in Ecclesiastes. So I have noted that all of the vanity words are marked in blue. I've got that on my legend, my key that's at the beginning. So if I'm, I'm wanting a quick reference, I want to go through the word vanity in Ecclesiastes, all I have to do is start looking through the blue of my text, because my, uh, my legend at the beginning told me vanity is the key word, how many times it occurs, and that it's going to be blue in the, the text in Ecclesiastes. So do that with, uh, with every book. And that way, uh, when you're when you're going to be teaching these books uh, in the future, you know you've seen on the the uh, the whiteboard in the chapel the the writing down of these words. You know you've already got that. You all you have is your Bible that you brought to uh, to teach your class with, but you've already got the the legend for uh, that particular book written down in the introduction, and so you can. Uh, you can just write those down. Okay. Uh, something else. All right. So, finding keywords. Repetition is the way to do that. Now, if uh, 
you do not have something like logos, and uh, then there are more, there's more than one way to, to accomplish this task. There are tools out there uh, like uh, Young's Concordance, some Strong's Concordance, uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. There are tools out there that you can still accomplish this, but it's not nearly as fast. But this is my world in uh, 30 years of doing exegetical work. Those were the tools that I had to use. And so they're going to have it all broken down into one particular uh, form, and then I have to find the other forms. And I may not know the other forms. And so there, uh, there's a disadvantage. That's why early on, when we were first learning all that logos could do, uh, Mike would say, well, how many times does the word faith occur in the book of James? And I'll say, well, uh, according to my uh, work, it occurs 21 times. Well, he said, that's, that's not right. Uh, and uh, because he used the software, and it found some variant forms of the word pistis or pistos, the word for faith, that um, uh, my looking through Strong's or Young's uh, concordance did not show me. Well, that's okay if you, you miss a couple. It's, it's going to happen. But we're, we're going to show you a way that you can keep from missing any. And that's why my numbers change when I'll say, well, there's X number of occurrences of this word in, in a book. <clears throat> I may come back and, and revise that number by two or three because of how I'm, I'm learning how to use the, uh, the logo software. But if you're using a book, you can still get the general idea down and uh, turn your, your Bible into an exegetical study Bible with the color code. When there was somebody in North Carolina that was listening to my lecture during the homecoming, and he said, this idea about color-coding your Bible is something that I'm really intrigued about. Tell me about it. How do I get started? And uh, so you know, I explained it to him. I sent him um, all of the keywords for uh, the books of First Peter and Philippians, and I said, this is what you need to do. Here's the list. Every single verse is, is identified with the key word highlighted. Go in your Bible and highlight those words. And then I talk about uh, questions to ask and what it is that you're seeing uh, once you have uh, color-coded your Bible. So this is uh, really, arguably, the most important step in doing exegetical work, is trying to find out what is in the text. What is it that the inspired writer is emphasizing? And this step is consistent from New Testament to Old Testament. It is consistent across different genre of uh, literature. You still need to find keyword through repetition, whether you're talking about law or poetry or history or prophetic whether you're talking about gospel or apocalypse, it doesn't matter. You're still going to want to see what is the, the theme of the idea that is being oft repeated by this inspired writer. This is why I've made such a huge deal about translations that fail to do this. They are making it a lot more difficult for us to do quality exegetical work. And the New American Standard translators even said in the introduction <coughs> that they're doing this on purpose so that the, the, the reading doesn't start getting boring. I mean, it's the same word again and again. You know, the, the language is wonderful with all of these synonyms. Can't you give us some synonyms? Well, that may be well and good. When I'm talking to you in conversation, but when we're talking about the inspired word of God, and we believe that what Second Timothy 3:16 is teaching us, and that is verbal plenary inspiration, 
word for word inspiration. This is the word that God wanted. And that's the word he wanted here and here and here and here and here. We need our translations to consistently translate those words so that we see what's going on. Just like the illustration I gave in 1 Peter with the word honest or faith. He's hammering the idea of behavior. But you are never going to know that that particular word occurs seven times in that book if it's translated four different ways. But now that I know that, and I've got that marked, so I've got the word suffering marked, and I've got the word behavior marked, now I'm starting to connect some dots. I'm starting to ask some good questions about what First Peter is all about. You've got these people who are <clears throat> suffering, and Peter's writing this letter to talk about what? How do you act when you're being persecuted? Whoa. Well, find a commentary that's going to tell you that. You won't. But you're seeing, by looking at repetition of these words, you're seeing what the, what the author is emphasizing. And I'm going to give you some Old Testament illustrations of that, that once you color code your Bibles, these things start leaping off the page, and you say, wow, I, you know, I'm seeing something there that I would never have seen had it not been for the fact that I took time uh, color coding this. So, repetition, find those tools, uh, those Bible study tools that will give you the recurrence of these words. Um, I once heard someone say that the repetition is less uh, significant in narratives. Is that, or maybe I'm not sure less significant is the right word, but I must you know, understand what I'm asking. That is correct. Um, narrative is such where uh, there's just not, not a predominance of key words. And you're, you'll see them kind of crop up every now and then. And when you do, that's the time you say, all right, is, is he kind of pausing right here in the middle of this narrative, this story, to kind of bring us back to the spiritual point? And so, again, you're at, it, it leads you to ask the right questions. Well, less significant would not be the right word, though. It, it less is, predominant. Less predominant, just not as noticeable. Not as, okay. Right. And so, like you've got... <clears throat> in the book of Genesis, these list of key words, and you're going through the story of Abraham and Abraham <clears throat> traveling to Egypt and Abraham's encounter with Pharaoh, that's just not going to be a rainbow color of key words. It's just not going to be. But scattered through that, or maybe at the beginning and end of that particular story, you're going to see some key words, and then you go, all right, now I can see what's going on. So. All right. Second way to find uh, key words in Old Testament books is through purpose statements. Again, a purpose statement is where the inspired writer just tells us, this is why I'm writing. And so those first seven verses of Proverbs are inundated with key words. The first uh, chapter basically are um, in Ecclesiastes where he's talking about uh, what he's trying to accomplish there. It's gonna, you're going to have those, those key words. Is this uh, less frequent in the New Testament purpose statements at a book? It is more frequent. More frequent. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely. Yeah. Thankfully... Uh, we've got more New Testament books that have a purpose statement than the Old Testament. Third, the first chapter. The first chapter is a, always a place to look for uh, these key words, these major concepts that are going to be a part of a particular writing. Then, as I mentioned, this is genre specific. For prophetic books, look for, look for key words in the prophetic call. Now 
Now, you might be asking the question, why do we need really numbers 2, 3, and 4 if we got number 1? If, if we got number 1 and uh, we've done our research, we've got the master list of these words that just occur again and again and again in a particular text, then <coughs> is there really a point to looking at these others? The book of Acts is a good example, I think, because the word witness is a key word, but it isn't repeated that many times throughout the book. That's exactly the right answer, because there are going to be, and please hear me on this, theologically significant words that are not in the, the upper end of off-repeated words, and the word witness in the book of Acts is a perfect case in point on that. That's a very important word, because we're seeing the idea, you shall be my witnesses. Well, so we're talking about the witnessing of the gospel of Christ in four regions as we transition through the book of Acts. And so we're not hammering the word witness, but we're seeing the, the practical outworking of that particular theologically significant term. They are bearing witness to something. All right? So that's why we look at the prophetic call. That's why we look at the first chapter. That's why uh, we look for a purpose statement. And we're saying, all right, this may very well be uh, a key word in this book. And um, I'm going to give you some illustrations of that when we get to the New Testament uh, section as well. All right, so you need to study these words. You know, I'm going to do something to you. Yep, I thought I had gotten ahead of myself with him. Theologically significant words are, are what we're referring to. Is this still under preliminary step five? Yes. Still, yeah. Still step five. Whenever you generate these reports... The word and and the will always win the day. So I need to go through and I mark every time the word and occurs. No. <laughs> now that, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about that it becomes a theologically significant word just because it occurs most frequently. That, that's always going to be conjunctions and uh, definite articles or indefinite articles, A uh, and so, we are talking about words that have some theological significance. You might be tempted to say, well, the word God or the word Christ always wins this uh, battle for predominance. And so, I'm, I'm going to kind of bypass those and get to the, the other words. Don't do that. Don't do that because you are... <coughs> going to miss what's happening in the text like we've got uh, certain books and thinking of Ezekiel as uh, a case in point alright the word Yahweh occurs 439 times in Ezekiel. All right, well, I've gone through and I marked all 439 times. And it, it takes some time. But now that I've got it marked, I'm going to see two things. First of all, I'm going to see texts that are just 
inundated with the word Lord. And then there'll be texts that don't have the word Lord at all. And so now you gonna start asking one of these questions. Well, what's up with that? Because you say, well, 439 times, it, it's all over the place. No, it's really not. And so why is it really emphasized here and it doesn't occur at all there? That's the right question. That's an exegetical question. And then second, you'll find how the word interacts with other words. So when you've got the word Lord, well, I, I see frequently that the word Lord is in connection with the word blood or abomination. Well, okay, what's up with that? But you see these things when you've, you've got it color-coded, and uh, like with the book of Ezekiel, almost always when you uh, see the word sword, you're going to see the word blood. Now, that seems pretty logical, but that's an interesting point uh, to make. Sword is a key word in Ezekiel. Blood is a key word, but normally when those words occur, they're always in... The, the same context. And then abomination seems to uh, be that third word. So you got sword, you got blood, and you got abomination. What's up with that? What's going on with that? Uh, and so now you can start looking at the text and drawing conclusions as to where this inspired prophet is going with the repetition of these particular uh, concepts and ideas. Hey, welcome. We got two spots for you there. Right in front. Right in front. <laughs> Just like when you used to be in school. Good morning. We are uh, studying Old Testament exegesis. And uh, our, this guy right here is Hans Oler. Uh, Hans Oler is the preacher for Brighton and is uh, a, a graduate in 1995. And uh, he's worked in Oklahoma. He worked at Northwest and has been at Brighton now for how many years? Five years. And this is Tim Wood. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I was raised in the Church of Christ um, my whole life. I attend church where uh, Hans preaches, so. Good. <laughs> Glad to have you with us. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, in talking about uh, theologically significant words, <coughs> so you do your word searches in a book, let's just say Leviticus. And you generate this report, and you see altar, offering, sacrifice, priest, blood, and holy. So now you start going through your text, and you start, you start marking these. And once you go through and you mark these, then you've got two advantages. The first advantage is that you're going to be able to see the, the emphasis of that text as you're going through uh, studying the book of Leviticus. Be able to see what I've referred to as threads, things that kind of run through uh, the text. So why is it we're talking an awful lot about uh, the altar here, and then here we're talking an awful lot about holiness there. What's going on with that? So you, you see these themes and you also see uh, these threads. But you've also got uh, the advantage of not missing things that are important. Because our eyes are naturally drawn to color. And when we're going through that we're going to see the color. 
And that is going to remind us, oh wait, that's a key word. I guarantee you that you will blow right past key words that are not marked. You will not remember that they're a key word. You're going to be lost in uh, thinking about whatever point or observation that you're trying to make. And even if you're not teaching, but you're just writing something, you're, you're not going to remember that that's a key word in this book. But if you've got your Bible color-coded, now it's screaming at you. It's saying, look at me. Now, I'm, I'm one of the key words for this book. And now all of a sudden, you, that's right. And I don't want to miss the fact that the word altar is one of the predominant words in this book. So you've got, you've got these pluses when you're getting these key words together. Joshua. You do your word study and all of a sudden you see a predominance of the word give and the word possess and the word land. Well, okay, I mark that and all of a sudden I start seeing some things that's happening in the text. And what's interesting, just since we're talking about Joshua, is that God says that I'm going to give you the land. Sometimes he says, I have given you the land, and he hasn't given it to him yet. Like with the city of Jericho, he uses it in the future tense and in the past tense. What is up with that? Well, God's promises are sure. And the, he's given it to him. Now, this is a, a, a time where you would say, but wait a minute. They're having to march around. They're, the walls went down, but they still had to go in and fight the, the soldiers in the city. Uh, they, they had to take the city. So what's up with this give? Well, there's an opportunity for you to understand what's going on in the, in the book of Joshua. I'm giving you the land, but that doesn't mean that you know it's going to be on a silver platter and I kind of cleared out all the population before you got there. So you know, come on in, everything is all, uh, all set and table ready for you. Now, can you make a spiritual application from that? If you can't, then you're in the wrong school. Maybe the wrong occupation. Because that's what we're talking about with grace. God's given us grace. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to have to march around the city of Jericho seven times in order to get the prize. That's just the way God works. But it is give. That's uh, the whole idea. So what's he given? He's given the land. To what end? For that to be a possession. It's something that is going to be theirs to have and to keep. And will be a continual reminder of the, the wonderful uh, love of their God. Okay? That's Joshua. That's what the book of Joshua is all about from beginning to end. And you got that by just doing a simple search. What are the repeated words, the key words that are found in this book? All right, what about something like 1st, 2nd Kings? Well, you generate this report, uh, and it starts coming up with throne, build, my servant David, then a phrase, did evil in the sight of the Lord, Jeroboam, the phrase, high places. Now, let me add a little bit to that. 
that you don't, that's not on the PowerPoint, but, but get in your notes. The, the word Lord occurs 257 times in 1 Kings. Is it the word Yahweh there? It is. Okay. How many times I was? 257. The word king occurs 306 times. Now, when you go through and you mark the text of 1 Kings, you're going to see a very interesting phenomenon. And that is when the word king is predominating the, te- the, the text, the word Lord is nowhere to be found. Could you repeat that? When the word king is predominating the text, the word Lord <laughs> is scarce. If it occurs at all. Whereas when you've got a text that you've got the word Lord occur a lot, then you won't see the word king so much. And the same is true in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Don't have... uh, uh, First and Second Samuel on the PowerPoint, but since I'm making uh, this particular observation, in First Samuel the word Lord occurs 320 times. The word King occurs 104 times. Denny. Now, a question I have is, like on this slide, you say kings in kings, Jeroboam is a is a predominant, um, I guess you'd say character. Is that going to be the case? I mean, like with the with the epistles or or the the gospel writings. Well, obviously Jesus is going to be a predominant because that's what it's talking about. So. I mean, do we have to filter the characters? Yeah. Uh, And, for example, someone might never have thought that Nebuchadnezzar would be a key word in Jeremiah. But, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on him, the man. Uh, Anybody remember which gospel is considered to be Peter's gospel? Mark, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Well, guess what? Who has an awful lot about Peter? <laughs> well, the Gospel of Mark does. So you might want to, when you're marking up the text of, of the, the Gospel of Mark, color every time the word Peter occurs. Because there's something going on with, with Peter as opposed to naming any of the other uh, of the twelve. Okay? I don't know if I'm... If I, is that kind of what you're I asking? guess maybe a better question would be, do you ever consider a character or a word significant that really is not? I mean, you, you've colored your Bible and you look at this purple word and it's 400 times in a book and you're like, it really doesn't have anything to do with it. Never once. Okay. Never once had that happen. Unless it's an N and a D uh, type word. Uh, but outside of that, the, the closest that, that we're going to get to that is the idea of um, the word erikomai in Greek, which means to come or to go. Well, in the Gospels, you're talking about an awful lot of coming and going. And uh, Jesus is going there, and he's coming from here, and these people are coming from there, and they're going to go to there. And there's erikomai going on all the time. Matter of fact, um, don't have my... Uh, my Greek with me, but I'm thinking that that particular word occurs something like 900 times. And so you might say, okay, that obviously is a predominant word as far as number of occurrences, but I- I'm not seeing how it becomes a key word. That's 
may be a remote possibility, but what we found, and I'll switch over to the, the Gospel of Matthew, is Matthew was doing something that's very cool. And there is so much about Matthew that we didn't have time to talk about. But Matthew is developing this idea of coming to Jesus. And he's got it where you've got um, people that come to Jesus for healing, people that come to Jesus for instruction, people that come to Jesus to test him, people that come to Jesus with the intention of harming or persecuting him. Uh, And so it, it develops into an amazing lesson about the Gospel of Matthew, where you could you could preach this or you could teach this, and just talking about the various groups that come to Jesus and the reasons why they're coming to Jesus, and then talk about application. Why are you coming to Jesus? What what is your purpose? Because some people come to church, come to Jesus, maybe by coming to church, um, because well. <laughs> You know, my parents me. So you have an opportunity to talk about the, to the teens. Why are you here? I mean, if your parents didn't make you, would you be here? Probably not. Uh, or, you know, uh, people come to Jesus because it's the bad thing to do, popular thing to do. What? So there's these, this thing that's going on that's developed in Matthew just by... Uh, a key word. And I think you'll find in the Gospel of John, even though the Eric my word group occurs so many times, it has pockets in where it's very thematic. And I guess my thing is, is you know, you, you spend all this time and, and you really put your, your sweat and your, your ink into the Bible and then all of a sudden, you know, once it's there, you can't take it out. Uh, yeah, you you can. <laughs> you need to get the um, um, the the Crayola pencils that okay. have the erasers on it. <laughs> and so, if you ever said, "All right, this was a, a, a practice in futility. I want to take all those out." If you buy those pencils, they don't bleed through, uh, and they do have erasers on them. Then uh, you can go back and and you can erase that. But you like those better than the pens, then? They're not a spine, though, right? They're, well, you just have to keep them sharp. Uh, but <laughs> I get a spider man. Yeah. But they're, I like them because you can buy the box of 24 colors. <laughs> and you can uh, uh, erase them if you, if you mess up. Did that come with the SpongeBob coloring book? It's not have. Yeah, I know that's disappointing to you, but uh, you'll have to buy that separately. <laughs> Some things have never changed. Yeah. <laughs> so now when you're going through it, you might have already indirect, indirectly answered this, but you know, words that you know what what you're saying the NASB did on purpose where they translated a different way. For example, Ephesians three twenty, Bob went over this the other day about now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Those are the same word. Now, do you do the same color for both of them? Absolutely. Because that's exactly what you want to see. You want to see that that word is what's being hammered. And even though my English text has translated it different ways, that's still the word uh, that is, uh, that's being emphasized there. So that's what you want to do. And did you say it was... New King James Version that translated it the same every time, or or what? It's the best. They they're not as consistent with this as I'd like, but they're more consistent than any other English translation. Okay. Can I ask another question about translations? Okay, so that one is more consistent how it translates it. Then you know I also know that it's based off the older text. So is there a give and take that you want one that's based off the newer text? I mean, or would you just say, you know what I'm? That making sense? I'm totally out of there. Well, I think what that's telling us is, is we, we need to use uh, multiple texts. But obviously, you know, I've got one Bible here. And I'm not going to color code three or four different Bibles. I'm going to use one. But getting back to, you know, the, the, the question that Rob was asking, 
even with the new American standard that translated it different ways, I'm still color coding it the same. And when, when you do that, now you're not tripped up by the fact that the, the word honest profane is translated behavior here and conduct there and way of life there because they're all in, in, in my Bible, they're all in uh, red. So now I'm seeing what's there and I'm not, I'm not distracted by the fact that it's translated differently. So you can boil you can boil it down to one of the the core translations. The NIV is going to be a crash and burn because they're not even going to have the words there at all. Uh, but the major translations that we've talked about, you can you can do this because they're trying to translate every word, and that's what we need. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. My my question was a little bit probably of a side note anyway, so. Mine really, my question kind of went back to the idea of if one is based off of the older text and it doesn't include the newer text, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatever, the Texas Septicus versus the other, would you want to pick a study Bible that has the newer ones, even though the New King James is better at the word for word consistency? Yeah, no, that, uh, that is not a significant enough of uh, a thing to say, well, I'm going to not go with the New King James or not go with the King James. Okay. Because... The, the examples of what we're talking about as far as exegesis are so few okay. that it's just not going to matter. Okay. Job, here is a, a list of keywords for that book. <coughs> Okay, let's suppose that I don't have logos and I, I don't have Young's concordance or Strong's exhaustive concordance. I don't have any of those, any of those tools. Then what do I do? And I'm doing this more for the benefit of the video conferencing because... Uh, there'll be people watching this uh, class in, you know, foreign countries, and they may not have uh, access to any of those tools. There are free Bible programs online, like ESOR. ESOR does have concordances. They are a part of uh, their, their offerings. And so you can have access to uh, Bible concordances uh, through free internet uh, Bible software uh, programs like eSort. So they're out there. As a matter of fact, if you just did a search of Bible concordances, it'll generate uh, a list of places where you can find a Bible concordance online that is free. So I'm assuming that if somebody has the technology in which they can watch this video, then they've got the technology of, of which they can, they can do a computer search in uh, various internet programs. Uh, but if for some reason even that's not possible, then you've got to do it the old, old, old-fashioned way, and that's just... Uh, you listen to a book all the way through, and as I'm going through, I'm thinking, well, I sure am seeing the word wicked an awful lot as I'm reading through Job. So I write down on my notepad the word wicked, and then I start writing down every time I see that word. And that's the old-fashioned way. 
But way back in the 70s when I first started preaching and the computers were not available and all that, um, that's the way I did it. And I still, I still have saved those notepads <clears throat> of which I've got my reading through these books and just making uh, a note to myself. And then, uh, you know, I add the next word. I said, well, it sure does seem like I'm seeing the word righteous a lot and the word wrath a lot. And so I'm just developing my own catalog of statistics. Virtually, I'm doing my own concordance. Uh, for these books, if I don't have my own. So, it can be done, and uh, fortunately there's software like Logos now that makes what used to be a process that would take hours and days, uh, a process that now just takes seconds. But it's still, uh, anybody and everybody can do this, whether they've got access to any kind of, of uh, study tool, if all they have is the Bible, it's still doable. For sure. Sometimes when you're looking at a word, all of a sudden it dawns on you that that is a, a word that's a part of a phrase. Like, shall know that I am the Lord occurs an astonishing 64 times in Ezekiel. That's amazing. That one particular phrase is going to be hammered so often. Well, yeah, the word Lord occurs, what was it, 300 and some odd times. But this phrase itself occurs 64 times. And what's up with that? And how, how is the phrase used and applied? In, uh, in the text? Well, good questions. The right questions to ask. In Lamentations, the, the Lord and then the verb has uh, is something that all of a sudden you're seeing now we've got Basically, the beginning of uh, the a sentence with the Lord as the subject, and now God is actively doing uh, something. And so, what is it that the text is telling us that the Lord has done? Well, the Lord has given me into their hands. The Lord has trodden, as in a wine press. The Lord has commanded. The Lord is covered. The Lord is swallowed up. The Lord has become like an enemy. The Lord has caused to be forgotten. The Lord has rejected his altar. The Lord has determined to destroy. I mean, on and on you go in the book of Lamentations. Here the city's been destroyed. And this book is a dirge, a, a warning song on behalf of the dead Jerusalem. And what has the Lord done? Well, the Lord has done this. The Lord has done that. Well, now you're kind of getting uh, what Lamentations is all about. And it's something that's illustrating the activity of God. Even something like Obadiah, as short a book as it is, still has its share of key words. <coughs> Edom six times, possession five times, the word day eleven times. So you can go through, you can mark that word in uh, the book of Obadiah. And that's going to help you. It's going to help you see some things. It's going to help you see a, a flow and some emphasis and a thread uh, that's running through that book that uh, you would not see otherwise. Okay, so we had to back up. I already showed you this screen, but by uh, just a reminder... Finding keywords, repetition, purpose statement, first chapter, and then prophet, prophet, our prophetic books, the, uh, the prophetic call, I'm going to be uh, looking for keywords. Because this is a question that somebody uh, will ask you and you'll ask yourself is, all right, so I'm going to study Leviticus. 
I have no idea what the key words are. So how am I supposed to find out what the key words are? Now, if they have a commentary, there is a very high percentage that commentary is not going to tell them that. Because commentaries are not exegetical. So they're not interested in identifying key words or repetitive words in the book. You don't have access to a study tool, a concordance or uh, something like Logos, and you can't get on the internet. Then the only way to find these key words is what I was talking about a minute ago, and that's the notepad. You start reading, but you're writing down, what about this word? It sure does seem like I'm seeing this word uh, an awful lot. And then uh, you start uh, you know, verse by verse. Every time you come across that word, you write down, all right? It's in chapter 2, verse 3. It's in chapter 2, verse 8. It's in chapter 2, verse 12. And so you're creating a master list of your own. That's the only way to do it outside of using tools. All right, so with these keywords, then you need to study these keywords. This is still a part of step number five. You find the keywords, now you study the keywords. With Logos, you have the most powerful Bible study tool ever developed. There are people that say, oh, there are lots of good Bible study programs out there that are a whole lot cheaper than Logos. But what they don't understand, and uh, Mike and I have found it impossible to get them to understand, is that those other Bible study programs won't really help you do the kind of exegetical work that we're trying to teach you here. How so? Because some of these other Bible study uh, tools can produce master lists of keywords, but they don't have certain features like the visual filters that I was talking about, where I want to have my text, I want all the, the, the future tense verbs marked in blue. I want all the aorist tense verbs marked in red. I want all of the prepositions that are used to be highlighted in yellow. Uh, I want all of the infinitives to be a double underline. And so I'm given all of these commands on how I want the text to give these visual filters. There's not another study tool out there that I know of that does that. But those are crucial. Uh, um, that, that is one example of a crucial tool that you need to really do good exegetical work in uh, the biblical text. So, anyway, it's it's expensive, but it is worth uh, it's worth the money spent. It is undoubtedly the most powerful Bible study tool that's ever been developed, and they're constantly uh, working and tweaking on it. And uh, so, we've got at our disposal something that is uh, amazing. So, how do we use this tool then to study words? It's as easy as a, a right click on the word. And you do not have to know Hebrew, you do not have to know Aramaic, you do not have to know Greek to do quality word study, uh, word studies uh, in Old or New Testament. Because you already have those books in your library, you can right click and it, then it will ask you, all right, which uh, study tool do you want to use? Well, you can just, if you're just trying to get some basic definitions, then you can call up the uh, ana analytical lexicon. Or if you're wanting more information than that, then you can call up uh, Brown Driver Briggs or one of the other uh, Old Testament word study tools that you got it at your disposal. It's right there. And all it was was just a quick way. You didn't have to know the Hebrew word. You didn't have to know verb forms or, or noun forms or anything like that. 
was already there, uh, right there for you, and it generates this, uh, uh, instantly finds that, uh, that word for you and gives you as much information as you want. So now you're, you're exposing yourself to the, the meanings of these words, the nuances of these words. Now here are the best word study tools in the market. First is Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. In TDNT, you look up the English word. And when you look up the English word, uh, it will tell you where you're going to find uh, that particular word in any of the ten volumes that are part of TDMT. Now, you say, okay, I'm confused. I thought we were still talking about Old Testament exegesis. Well, we are. And because it's Old Testament exegesis, a lot of people don't think to go to TDNT Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Why would I go to uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament in order to study Old Testament words? Well, the reason is because it starts with the Old Testament cognate before going to the New Testament. All right, so I'm wanting to study the word grace. Well, what was the Old Testament word for grace? Well, TDNT is going to start there. I said, seriously, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's going to start with the Old Testament, and then it's going to work your way through the intertestamental period, and then it's going to bring you to the New Testament, and then it's going to bring you to the, uh, uh, the early church fathers on how uh, that word was used as well. So, basically, TDNT brings you through four eras of time, in looking at a word, Old Testament, Intertestamental, New Testament, Early Church. Well, how cool is that? But the point that we're making now is it starts with the Old Testament. So don't neglect the opportunity to, to study a, an Old Testament word through the use of the New Testament, a new a theological dictionary of the New Testament. It is a part of Logos. And so you can make this uh, a part of your library, which is wonderful. It is very, very cool that it's a, a part of the logo software. And then if you're going to get real serious about the Old Testament study, then get Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, T-D-O-T, This is not an add-on uh, to Logos yet. I'm hoping that someday it will be. But uh, anyway, that's that's another way to study words, keywords. Another is the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, NID NTT. Colin Brown. This is based on English, and so it's more user-friendly. See, T 
TDNT is broken up uh, by the Greek word. And so if you're wanting to study love, and you don't know that the word for love is agape, then you got to go to the dictionary and look up love in the, in the, um, the index, and then they'll send you to where the word agape is uh, actually discussed. Well, that's one step that, in my experience, discourages people and they don't even want to mess with it. Whereas uh, the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, and you're wanting to look up the word love, you look up L uh, for love. I mean, it's all, and then they have the Greek word there for you, or the various words that are translated love in the New Testament are all broken down. So, uh, like TDNT, it studies the Old Testament cognate. So if you're studying the word love, you're actually beginning looking at the Hebrew word for love. Is that a one volume? Three volume. Three volume. Now, the absolute best word study tool is TDNT. But I give a lot of props to, to this three-volume set. And it is very scholarly, it is very thorough, and <clears throat> it is a more user-friendly uh, study tool than TDNT. So if, if there is somebody that is just wanting to study their Bible, they're not a preacher, um, they're just a member of the church, but they're wanting to do some deeper work, some more quality word study work. And they say, Denny, what would you recommend? This is what I recommend. I recommend Colin Brown. It's not that expensive. Uh, they can basically get it for uh, around 100 bucks. And uh, very, very user friendly. Is it also on Lotus? <coughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is available as an add on. So I have it. Uh, I have obviously TDMT as well. One of the things you need to make sure that uh, when Michael is talking about this part of what book you want to add, like when you right-click on a Greek word, it's going to call up the list that you've told it you want to be your primary uh, study tools in looking at a Greek word. And if you have... Uh, NIDNTT in your library, but you don't have it as one of your main study tools, it can get lost in the shuffle. And so you, you need to, to make good choices on when you right click on a word and it calls up your library that can help you study that word, what books you want there. Now, it's going to ask you, and it's going to have a little blue word more. And so the, the five that you selected are, are right there. And you can click on more. It's going to open it up to everything that you've got in your library that can study that word. All right, so it's yet one more click away from maybe finding uh, Colin Brown in your library. But these are the ones I would recommend that you have on your top five is um, – uh, you know, TDNT and uh, Colin Brown. Now, more specifically to setting the, the Hebrew Old Testament is what is referred to as BDB, Brown Driver Briggs.
Hebrew and English lexicon. This is known as the Art Genrich of the Old Testament, or the B Day of the Old Testament. Considered the number one source for definition of Hebrew words. Numero uno. BDB. part of your Logos Bible software. <clears throat> and so as a result, it is much easier to find words because back in the day, uh, when I was first doing Old Testament word studies, you have to know Hebrew because the whole dictionary is based on the Hebrew word. And there was not an English uh, index in the back where you could even look up the English and it would send you to the right Hebrew word. You just had to know Hebrew. And if you didn't, even though this was... The definitions of these Hebrew words were in English. You can never find the word if you didn't know uh, what. I, I want to study the, the Hebrew word day. All right, it's Yom. I have no idea what that looks like. So how, how am I going to look it up in the dictionary? Because I don't know what Yom looks like in Hebrew. Well, you just couldn't find it. And so that was before Logos came around, a very discouraging aspect, because this is the number one Hebrew Bible study tool on the market, and it's in English, but most English people can't use it, because they don't know Hebrew. Well, now you don't have to worry about that. Now you can right-click, you can say, bring me to this word in uh, BDB, just like that. There it is. It brought you right to the word, and you got it. So, very, very cool that the number one Hebrew study tool is uh, available in your local software. Again, you're going to need to ask uh, or tell your software to make this your number one uh, book that's called up. When you right-click on the, on the word, say, I want to go to BDB first. Mike will show you how to do that. Now there are obviously there are, there are other study tools out there. You're going to find some uh, some study tools that are in your uh, your logo software that's just uh, free. You've got Spiros Zodahatis and his work on uh, word studies. Pretty good work. Uh, pretty good work. But um, always use the biggies. Uh, first, the major uh, study tools first, and then uh, navigate down to uh, some of these lesser works, uh, depending on how much time you've got. Um, maybe all you've got time is just a, a quick basic definition. But if you're really studying uh, a book, and you've identified in the book of Leviticus the, the word offering as a key word. All right, do not assume that you know what that word means in a Hebrew Old Testament context. 
Take some time to study that word. Now, there will be times that you'll find, okay, I got it. I, 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 this is what the word means, and there's nothing uh, funny going on with how that word is being used or applied. Okay, that's fine. Now that you've got that established, then you can, you can move forward. But you will find that there are these words that have varieties of meaning and application. And you've got to know that. So, like the word dikaiosune in the book of Romans. Well, sometimes it's justification. Sometimes it's righteous. Uh, sometimes it's righteousness. You know, well, what's going on with that? It's all a part of the same word. But, you know, when I look at my English, I see that it's translated different ways. What are the different ways that the word dikaiosune can be understood? Well, that's, that's something that you need to know. Okay. So, determine the genre. Read through the entire work. Consult several translations. Determine if the author provides insights to the purpose. Discover key words and phrases. All right, now we're getting more specific. And that is, determine your pericope. Remember, pericope means a section or a paragraph. This is what Walter Kaiser had to say about this, and this was a part of uh, what you had in your, uh, those of you that copied the quotes down, so you should already have this quote. Good exegetical procedure dictates that the details be viewed in light of the total context. Unless the exegete knows where the thought of the text begins and how that pattern develops, all the intricate details may be of little or no worth. This ability, the ability to state what each section of a book is about and how the paragraphs of each section contribute to that argument, is one of the most crucial steps. If the exegete follow, falters here, much of what follows will be wasted time and effort. So, getting context Understanding uh, the starting and ending point is very, very important in doing exegetical work. So we've got to determine the pericope, the paragraph. Now, how do you do that? First of all, by analyzing the text. You're looking for logical starting and stopping points. logical starting and stopping point. First, and this is always the most important, is a grammatical marker. A grammatical marker like <clears throat> after that or in a prophetic book, then the Lord showed me, or in Jeremiah, a grammatical marker, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, that's the beginning of a, of a new pericope. So I'm looking for these grammatical markers that are uh, found in the text to help me determine a pericope. 
Another way is a continuation of a story or, or an illustration. might have a particular story that runs several chapters. Well, that is one massive pericope. But, for example, I've used this as an illustration of Abraham and Sarai going to Egypt. Well, that's one large pericope because it's one story from beginning to end about Abraham's decision to go to Egypt, lie about his wife, and then all of the, the ramifications of that lie that took place. <clears throat> so it's not going to be two or three verses, one little bitty paragraph, like that could be the size of the pericope in Ephesians. But now in Genesis, we're looking at a, a pericope that really is several chapters. But that's, all we, that's what we got to know. What is this section? Where does it start? Where does it end? Look for something that is going to be an indicator, a clear indi indicator of a new topic. <clears throat> In the book of Exodus, you will have Moses telling us the people set out for a new place. Well, all right, so all of the events that took place at that location uh, were done with that. Now we're moving on uh, to a new place. The generations that we were talking about in the book of Genesis, those are uh, an introduction or the conclusion of that particular section. Now we're moving on to a, another generation, another person, and that's going to be uh, who we talk about for the next chapter or several chapters, depending on which character uh, that we're talking about in the, the, the book of Genesis. All right, so that's one way to do this. <coughs> But there's also a second way outside of analyzing the text, and that is check the divisions that you have in your Bible. your Bibles to Exodus 39. Do you have anything in your text that gives paragraph markers, like the, the first letter of a verse is bold, whereas the others are not, or there's a, a separation. So, well, what do you what do you got? What is your, your Bible telling you are the, the pericopes of Exodus 39? Uh, just verse 1, and then verse 2 is bolded. Go down to verse 6 is bolded. Verse 8 is bolded. Verse 22, verse 27, verse 30, 32, and it looks like that's it. Okay. Anybody have something different than that? That, that was that New American Standard? Yeah. Exodus 39? Right. Mine only has one heading, the whole thing. No, I can mention it. It's wow. It's about the same with the ESV. Okay. <clears throat> Do you see what we're looking at now, Dan? Yeah, yeah. It's about if that's the way we're looking at it, it's about the same as what he has. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. 
Is there any logic to their breaking it down this way? Was there anything that you saw that said, well, I, I see uh, why they're saying verses 2 through 7 or 1 pericope and verse 8 is a new one? Um, what do you see? It says he, they, he, they, he, they. That's not it. Well, I'm about that. <laughs> but go, go, go more than that, though. Not just the he, but the what? Well, in verses 2 through 7, it's talking about making the ephod. In verses 8 through 21, it's talking about the breastplate. About what about the breastplate? Uh, making the breastplate. There you go. Now, now we're talking about the right words. Okay, and then what? Uh, 22 through 30, or I'm sorry, 22 through 32 is making the other priestly garments, and then from 32 on to the end of the chapter is the work is completed. You see that? Now, that's the way that this is being broken down, and they actually did a good job exegetically in determining the pericope. Verses 2 through 7 we're talking about making the ephod. Verses 8 down through verse 21, we're talking about making of the breastplate. Verse 22, then he made the robe of the ephod. Verse 27, and they made the tunics of the finely woven linen. Verse 30, and they made the plate of the holy crown. Then verse 32 Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent was completed. So, they made this, and then they made that, and then they made this, and then they made that. That's determining the pericope, and we're seeing, by looking at the text, these natural divisions. Now, that's what I was talking about by a grammatical marker. So, maybe I wouldn't have seen the grammatical marker they made or he made uh, at first, but by looking at the way that my Bible has it divided, that, that was what identified the various pericopes. All right, we'll pick up after that. After chapter.